first thing we do is that we celebrate that everyone has their risks, both IT and OT, and everybody's doing the best they can to reduce it. Welcome everyone to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions, who's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how's it going? I'm very well, thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Ed Amoroso. He is the CEO at Tag Cyber. He is a research professor at New York University. And, you know, before all of that, he spent a long time as the chief security officer at AT AT&T. And he's going to talk to us today, you know, uh, he's he's got a strong background then in the the telecoms end of, uh, you know, industrial control systems. He's going to talk to us today about the... uh, the the IT perspective, the IT view of OT security. Okay, let's jump in with you and Ed. Hello, Ed, and and welcome to the show. Um, before we get started, can you say a few words uh, about yourself and and about your your role at you know Tag Cyber and, and New York University? Uh, happy to do so, Andrew. Um, first of all, thanks for including me in the uh, Podcast that I always enjoy chatting with you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So, so I've been in cybersecurity for, believe it or not, almost four decades. That's a long time, um, and spent most of my career over at AT and T as their chief security officer, and then uh, then I retired a few years ago to commit myself to disrupting the research and advisory business. That's Tag Cyber. We really do try to democratize good, solid research, information, um, guidance for enterprise teams on that vast number of um, commercial vendors that you see when you walk out on the RSA Expo floor and you look out over all those booths and you say, my goodness, how in the dickens am I going to make sense of all of this? That's what we try to take on at TAG to, to, to give some assistance to enterprise teams trying to rationalize all that. And I balance that, as you said earlier, with the work at um, – NYU in the computer science department also uh, teach some courses over at Stevens, and I have a, a, a advisory role down at the Applied Physics Lab at Hopkins. So I try and balance uh, academia with business and with uh, the vendor, but it's all wrapped in cybersecurity, which has been my passion for basically my whole life. So our topic today is um, is IT perspectives on OT security, and. You know, in my experience, uh, we've seen IT teams in the last really 24 months become much more active in the OT security space than they were sort of on average historically. So, you know, can you talk to us about sort of this this changing landscape when when an IT team suddenly is given or discovers that they have and you know maybe have been neglecting responsibility for OT security? Where do they start? It's a really good question, and 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 maybe there's a couple of dimensions to the question, uh, Andrew. I mean, it's what, what, one dimension. Be where where do they start? The second might be where should they start? Because I think, unfortunately, there might be a little bit of distance between those two. But let me preface by saying, in my own experience working in telecommunications, I had the great advantage of kind of doing both. Right? I mean, there was a very traditional IT security component to running the program for a large telco, you know, hundreds of thousands of people using uh, computers and networks and systems to to do everything from billing to the day-to-day work, but also had a pretty massive physical infrastructure, the equipment that's required to operate tier one telecommunication services. So I got a, a, a bird's eye view into the problems that emerge in dealing with um, you know SCADA control and other types of uh, OT-based um, monitoring, management, and and securing of uh, tangible uh, infrastructure, op- operational infrastructure. So I got to see both. So the first part is where do IT teams turn today, and and I think Andrew today they tend to go where they're comfortable. <laughs> so, so if a, if presented, say, with a, an org change where suddenly a big chunk of the OT uh, risk management or security um, operations falls under, say, the traditional chief information security officer, that CISO is probably going to spend some time 
with the consultants, the vendors, the people, the, um, the leaders in her or his organization that have experience in and around IT security. So it would be a lot of the familiar names and logos. And this may be just fine. You know, consultants that help you with risk in IT can certainly help you with risk in OT. The problem is, and this gets to the second dimension of the question, namely, where should they be turning? The problem is that there are companies, I mean, Andrew, you're, you're, you're associated with one of the better ones, Waterfall, that there are companies that really do specialize in helping to, to deal with the very specific problems and diverse problems that emerge with OT infrastructure. It's different stuff. It's different equipment. It's different systems. And uh, as I'm sure we'll spend some time during our discussion uh, today, the, the risks can be uh, quite different as well. So, so I think in the best case, they would uh, an IT security team, rather than just sort of restrict themselves to the familiar, would be a little promiscuous here. Maybe get to know some new firms that offer uh, controls and offer safeguards that can be uh, best tailored to their OT environment. I think that this may be the first time in our show's history that we've actually talked about telecoms in any meaningful way. Andrew, could you start us off with a sort of broader picture of what kind of infrastructure uh, we're looking at? At a very high level, in my understanding, there's uh, you know three or four elements to telecoms. Um, there is let's let's start with what's called the last mile. It's the connection between the telecom system and subscribers. In the old days, it was the telephone system. It was a wire running at everybody's house. Um, in the modern day, you know, a lot of it is wireless. A lot of it's coming in through cell phones. But the the last mile is is sort of the connection to the subscriber, and behind that, it's all switching infrastructure. So the you know, in the old days, the telephone wires went into a, a, a local, you know, a neighborhood switching center where uh, they all got connected together. All of the, the, uh, the calls were multiplexed onto high-speed communications and uh, were pushed off to another switching center. And these switching centers are sort of, there's a, there's a hierarchy of them, and eventually they go into a, a mesh network that's analogous to the, the transmission grid in the power system. Everything is connected to everything in, in the, the, the ultimate backbone. Um, and, you know, everything from the last mile in, all of them are, are switching technology that is figuring out where's this connection going and switching it and routing it to the, uh, you know, the next, across the next uh, fiber optic nowadays. You know, in the past it was microwave, in the past it was, uh, you know, buried uh, copper. But this is, you know, this is the, the telecoms infrastructure. It's some kind of last mile connection out to subscribers, wired or wireless, and then switching infrastructure and uh, connections between switches, working up into a hierarchy. And ultimately, the backbone is this massive mesh network where lots of things have, have lots of connections and lots of redundant paths to get from from A to B. But you know, coming back to the the, the topic of of <clears throat> industrial control systems. Um, the the telecom space, in a sense, is more like a pipeline than than it is like a, a you know the the you know than it is like a, a power generation company or a, you know an, an oil refining company. If you're producing power, you might have a hundred power plants. This one has a Siemens control system. That one has a Wonderware control system. The other one has a GE control system. All the screens are different. All the procedures are different. It's, it's very much a hundred different things. You try to standardize, but you're always buying and selling these assets. And, you know, the control systems go with the asset. A pipeline is less like that. You know, a pipeline generally has one control center. There might be 20 operators sitting in that control center, but there's one control center controlling the entire pipeline. And if that control center, you know, burns to the ground, there's another one some miles away where everybody drives over to and takes over the the, the pipeline. Telecoms is like that. You know, AT&T was big enough to have multiple control centers, but each control center would control a wide swath of the, the switching infrastructure. It's not true that every little neighborhood switch had its own control center. There's a, a very small number of control centers that sort of watch and control almost everything. Does that not introduce more risk 
that you might have in any one large swath, as you mentioned, uh, a single point of failure that could cause the whole network to come down for a lot of people at once? That's a good question. You know, in light of of cybersecurity concerns, um, the thing is that you know the nation's pipelines and telecoms networks and their control centers were designed rather sometime before cybersecurity was sort of the the big imperative that it is today. And, you know, it is what it is. These pipelines are controlled from a single site. The uh, the telecoms infrastructure, in my understanding, is controlled from a small number of sites, each of which controls a large swath of infrastructure. That's how it is. That's, that's uh, you know, that's, that's the way the world is. That's the, the reality we have to secure. Can you go a little deeper? Um, you know, assuming they, they, they start talking to the right people, um, then what? It's, it's one thing to talk to people. It's another thing to, to act. What, how, where, where should people start? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, IT uh, security teams are very good at monitoring. They, they, they know and understand the importance of trying to collect information, get, gain visibility. That would be the term that an IT team would use, you know, visibility into, um, into what's there, you know, what, what infrastructure is in place. So I do think that's a good place to start, you know, a good starting point for a, a team to, to generally start to assess risk by uh, examining posture. That's another very familiar uh, term in the IT security parlance. They'd be collecting visibility, determining posture, doing monitoring. These are the kinds of things. So applying that, th- those kinds of strategies to an OT environment, that'd be a really, really good place to start because, you know, they're going to start g- gaining a, an understanding of what they're dealing with. It's going to be different. The risks are different. The consequences are enormously different. Um, not, and you know, Andrew, you and I, over the years, we've been friends a while. We we've talked about some of the differences between consequence in IT and in, um, uh, uh, OT systems. And I think that when IT security teams start to sort of poke around and learn, you know, understand what OT infrastructure looks like, get a general sense of the types of risks that emerge, they're going to find that these are, these are big risks in a lot of places, right? I mean, it can involve loss of life. It can involve the safety critical a- a aspect in many OT environments can be quite daunting. So so that for some will be a jolt. Again, in, in my life, it, it was something I'd grown up with in telecoms. I understood the physical consequences of uh, an OT attack. But but for a, an organization that may be just sort of taking on that responsibility or somebody moving from an IT job to an OT job as part of their career, when they're p- first presented with this um, understanding of risk, understanding of posture, and they start connecting that to consequence, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, uh, they realize they're in the big leagues at that point and that, you know, because pe- people potentially can die. If um, if a cyber attack is successful on OT infrastructure, so it requires one's full attention. If the teams, you know, start with with yeah, understanding consequences and visibility, um, often, you know, once once these these enterprise security teams get visibility into their OT systems, they will discover that, you know, most of the equipment in the OT system. Uh, it depends on the OT system. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm most familiar with things like power plants and, you know, refineries. And in, in a lot of these industries, you know, the, they'll, they'll get the visibility and discover that the HMI workstation that's been on continuously for, you know, 18 months since the last, uh, the last plant downtime where everything was refreshed, that workstation hasn't been patched for 18 months because it can't be because you'd, You'd lose visibility into the plant operation. You're not allowed to to run, you know, large physical processes blind for any length of time. So they find a lot of unpatched equipment. Some of the most important equipment they find hasn't been patched. Um, you know, what what do they do about this? What you know, how do they react? <laughs> it's a, it's such a common situation. I know, I know you deal with this all the time. Well, it, it happens all the time, right? I mean, in, in OT, you, you can't just shut something down. <laughs> I mean, you, can, you can reboot or shut down a whole system and, you know, some operational process breaks. So it's not, it's not like, um, hey, let's wait till, um, 
evening and then reboot the system while everyone's asleep. In most OT uh, environments and infrastructure, that, that just doesn't work. So, so it takes a lot of planning to do this. You have to be intimate with the engineering team, intimate with the operations team. There has to be a clear understanding of when something in fact can be upgraded. Fr- frankly, if ever, there may be some times when it just wouldn't make sense. I mean, y- as an IT security expert, I know that we're constantly weighing and doing the cost benefit analysis of upgrading systems where you do have to you know, impose some downtime, you know, usually of an SLA with an hour a month or whatever. I think, uh, you know, three nines or something, four nines is like an hour a month, whatever it is. I forget the exact number, but whatever it is, you'd be normally in an IT environment perfectly fine with just shutting things down, upgrading, patching, doing whatever you need to do. Um, And in a a non-critical environment, that is a very normal thing. You know, Andrew, that in most IT, OT environments, that's just not going to happen. It's not, that's not the way to go. You have to you know, put a plan together. And, and, and it's going to be different in each case because um, OT is, the, um, is a good example of, um, of, of a sector or a, a, a category of technology where there are uh, large uh, va- variations between the way things work. You know, you've mentioned a power plant that might be quite different than a, you know, clothing factory or which might be very different from a, uh, an automobile moving down the street or might be different than, you know, some um, uh, a process control uh, system that's, um, you know, managing some set of industrial activities. They're all different. And each of them will have a team of engineering and operations experts that the security team needs to work with to plan how these types of upgrades and changes would need to be made. So you're, you're right to ask that question because you and you mentioned 18 months, sometimes it'd be even longer than that. And that's normal. That's something an IT security team will have to get used to and, and will have to adapt to uh, when working with OT professionals. So it's a very, very common um, occurrence. One more thing that I think is important is that IT security teams, in many cases, will find this somewhat familiar, right? It's not always the case that you just kind of shut everything down. There are a lot of teams that understand they can't turn uh, banking infrastructure down. You can't turn down. Even something, I remember Andrew one time was working with uh, a, um, a casino, a large, one of the large gaming uh, companies. And we talked about doing some upgrades to the network. And we sort of jokingly had suggested um, – We'll wait till um, you know midnight uh, on Sunday and do it. And they started laughing and said, "Well, you'd be better off in a gaming setting doing it Monday at nine in the morning." <laughs> you know? So, so everybody has to sort of learn the specifics of what they're dealing with. But I, I do think that it is the case that for many IT security teams, this idea that uh, you know just sort of uh, rebooting systems to to install patches and stuff that that may not be such a um, an easy process or such a straightforward process it's going to depend let me expand on that for just a second um the you know in the in the it space even with banking infrastructure um you can't sort of reboot at will i i understand that um but often what you'll find is that there's enough redundancy in the system that at certain points in time when the, the risk is lower, when the, the load is lower, you can start rebooting some of the redundant components with the new software. And if it works, you can fail over to them and then you can start rebooting the, the, the other components. There's a process you can go through. Um, you know, one of the issues with, with uh, the OT space is that you can't always do that. There, you know, a lot of the time there just isn't that much redundancy in the system. Uh, there's some systems that look, if you reboot, you got to take the process down. But what that means is, is not that we can shrug our shoulders and walk away. The fact that we can't apply a fix for a known vulnerability does not make the vulnerability go away. We have to do something else. And this is where the, the, the space of, of compensating measures comes in that we've, we've talked about many times. Monitoring and intrusion detection is one kind of compensating measures. Strong network perimeters is another compensating measure. There's a number of compensating measures that are that are applied, you know, sort of uh, routinely 
in the OT space because of this this problem that that uh, Ed is talking about. You know, that brings up an interesting point. It's something that we've discussed on this show in the past, which is that, you know, OT systems aren't so simple. You, you can't just apply a, a patch by shutting down and rebooting a critical machine. But now that, that, that you mentioned that, I'm starting to think why that's necessarily the truth. Why can't we just build redundant systems in OT as we do in IT? Well, the short answer is that generally, but not always, we can. Um, there's a lot of redundancy in, in OT systems. Um, it's just not universal. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I remember, you know, working with one uh, uh, company, an oil company that had, uh, we were protecting their, their offshore platforms. And by policy, every control component on the offshore platform had a redundant and was com- it was was configured to automatically fail over uh, you know when when the primary failed the redundant would take over and so yeah um, you had that degree of redundancy in a lot of infrastructure that's not the case I mean historically infrastructure was was built um, to keep the physical process running the automation, job the job of the automation was to keep the physical process running and if the automation was reliable enough if the components simply didn't fail or reboot on their own um, at a rate that that uh, you know was a material impairment to the physical infrastructure then we'd say there's no point you know the, the reliability engineers would get involved and say there's no point having a redundant here there's other ways we can spend that money on automation to improve the uh, the results of the physical process and so they they would do that nowadays you know with this this patching imperative and we need to upgrade things um, we're seeing you know rather more often people are doing redundant everything but that's that's far from the case everywhere it's you know it's a it's a concept that I think is is uh, starting to to work its way into the the awareness of the engineering teams um, that you might have to sp- spend a little bit more on automation so that we get uh, you know, redundancy sufficient that we can start taking components down and doing things to them. We can be testing them for security, we can be applying patches, and so on. So coming back to, to first steps, the first step is visibility. Um, but are we talking about, you know, visibility into sort of the state of the network? Or are we talking about sort of something much more security specific, like in intrusion detection, or, you know, incidents in progress? What, what are, you know, what, what does visibility mean? To an IT security uh, uh, practitioner, it's going to mean monitoring. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the key element. Certainly, there's some static monitoring, but usually it's dynamic, where you're collecting data and trying to interpret it, trying to make sense of telemetry and pull data and logs and any, any other types of um, uh, information that can provide some contextual visibility into what's going on. You, you may notice, uh, Andrew, and I'll bet a bunch of the folks listening may, may notice that there's this trend in IT security toward these services that have the designation detection and response at the end. You know, I, I'd grown up in managed security services where you were more actively engaged in in managing and 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 keeping devices up. Like uh, like managing a router and doing uh, checks on it, and and if it was broken, you'd fix it. That was part of the early cadence of doing managed services. Now there's an awful lot of security services: EDR for endpoint, uh, MDR for managed, uh, uh, NDR for network, and so on. That where the 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 idea, the designation is EDR, endpoint detection response, where detection and response essentially dictate a, a more passive role in collecting data and then re- being responsive, being reactive to the data that's collected as opposed to you know, being more uh, in the mitigation path. So an awful lot of security teams right now um, do, do feel that monitoring is one of their most important roles and activities. And I think as they move into an OT context, this will be a, a natural progression. And that's a good thing, right? You want data to be flowing from an OT environment to a, an IT environment for that monitoring. I, 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 waterfall, you guys build a, a beautiful data diode, one I've, I've been a, a big fan of for years, where that kind of device can help to enforce that. And it'll be very comfortable for IT security teams to, to be pulling this data 
uh, but but also have the ability to at least sleep at night knowing that you know viruses are not being dropped into um, uh, a critical OT processing environment. So I think a, a, a security, IT security personnel will be very comfortable with this idea of monitoring. It's something that I suspect they will uh, take as one of the first obligations as they start working more closely with our OT teams. And this, this, the, the wind blowing in the direction of detection and response as, um, you know, as primary control activities. I, I do think that that's also consistent with this. So that's a good thing, right? Because I, I think, Andrew, one thing you, you, I suspect you would agree is that there is a trend toward IT security teams um, taking on more responsibility for OT. We do see that. I, I see that in my work at um, Tag Cyber all the time, you know, IT security teams asking many of the questions you've asked during this podcast, like where do I start? How do we monitor? What are some of the consequential differences here? We we help them with that, but I'll tell you, they they figure it out quickly, um, and uh, I think it's you know pretty consistent with the the discussion we've been having here. So I agree. We're we're seeing that uh, you know IT teams are becoming more engaged, but. You know, can I ask you what is the state of the practice? And, and and let me tell you a bit of a story to sort of illustrate. You know, this was a couple of years back. Um, you know, I'm at Waterfall. We were doing a lot of conferences, a lot of face to face marketing, and you know, I would show up and you know speak in 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 the session, and then go and hang out at the booth and you know get some first hand experience of of you know how are things going in terms of you know people coming by, what questions are asking. And, you know, I would see stuff like, you know, big conference, thousands of people, somebody comes by from, you know, a big company, big company X, you know, Fortune 100, uh, you know, tag on their, uh, you know, on their, on their badge, name on their badge, you know, hi, I'm from X, um, you know, what are you up to? We do, we do OT cybersecurity, you know, SCADA security, industrial security, whatever you want to call it, you know, what, what's your role at business X? Well, we, you know, we do the industrial control systems. Great, great. So, you know, we should be talking to you about security. No, 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 they say. No, no, we, we do the control systems. We don't do security. IT does security. You know, here's my business card. Send me email. I'll, I'll introduce you to the IT people. They leave. Uh, you know, two, three hours later, another person comes by, same company X, same company. Hi, you know, just spoke to a couple of your colleagues a couple of hours ago. What do you do? I'm with the IT security team. Ah, well then. You know, the enterprise security team, you're the people we want to talk to about industrial. Se- and, and if I may, you know, I start with, uh, you know, so you're responsible for for security enterprise wide. Yes, absolutely. All of it, including industrial control systems. And they go, uh, no, no, no. The control systems are special. Operations looks after them. So this was a couple of years ago, but we're talking big companies coming by. Operations says IT's got it covered. Enterprise security has got it covered. Enterprise security says uh, operations has got it covered. Nobody's got it covered. What's the pra- What's the state of the practice today? Is you know is this still a problem? It, it is still a problem, and I think that the anecdote you share is is probably very illustrative of what's going on in in a number of companies. There are still seams, um, and uh, you, you you'd like to at some point have something that is more uniform, but there, there's no question. That in the typical large organization, like I sit on the, uh, I run a board subcommittee for a large en- energy company, and it's definitely an issue that um, the seam that exists, and the seam is both architectural, you know, sort of celebrated in the uh, canonical ITOT gateway or set of gateways that exist. And that may not be so bad because I'm very much in favor of segregation. So I, I like the idea of segregation. What I don't like is a big seam down an organization that's there, maybe not uh, not not by design, but more by uh, either legacy or um, uh, just organizational. So so that seam could be technical, but but it all, also in many cases is is what you were alluding to in your example. Um, these organizational artifacts that pop up between this group and that group and that other group, you know, all with different backgrounds, all. But in many cases, almost all cases, are really smart, intelligent people. It's not like anybody here is not uh, capable with um, with great expertise in their in their um, specific area of um, of focus. 
That so that's never the the issue, especially in OT. I think Andrew, you would agree. Some of the uh, OT engineers that you run into, industrial engineers, uh, are amongst the smartest people you're ever going to run into in your whole life. You know, they're dealing with some really, really, really complicated systems. And I would also say that people who are attracted to IT security are are also extremely intelligent people. These are women and men who. Um, are attracted to a discipline that's not easy. It's sort of easy to hack. It's not so easy to stop hack. So these are very intelligent groups, and the idea is they speak different languages, they have different backgrounds, and and organizationally they've sort of grown up in different places. So it's not unusual that you would see seams. Then you mentioned, you know, talking to this company and people uh, pointing to some other group as having responsibility. Well, that is exactly what happens when you have seams. And that's not good. So, so it may be that um, it's a little bit higher than my normal pay grade here, or or, or any of our pay grades. You, it may be that the CEO and the boards need to sort of um, enforce and dictate and encourage a culture where the IT and OT teams work together and and try to uh, uh, achieve some common objectives and. Um, and work together to to kind of reduce gaps, to reduce remove seams, and to have teams work together. But right now, your your question was, what is the state of the practice? And I I think your your example is uh, very illustrative that there still are uh, some challenges that need to be dealt with. Some technical, some organizational, and some of them um, you know cooperative. So I, I hope that's a helpful uh, description of what I think is going on in most companies. Waterfall Security Solutions is the OT security company, and we are pleased to announce the Waterfall Industrial Security Institute. The Institute is a YouTube video series focused on industrial cybersecurity education and solutions. The first chapter of episodes features the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems. Understanding attacks is vital to designing robust cyber defenses. The Top 20 series introduces enterprise security practitioners to industrial operations concepts, while introducing engineering practitioners to cybersecurity offensive and defensive concepts. The Institute is making the first three of 20 episodes in the chapter available at launch. Number 1, ICS Insider. Number 2, IT Insider. And number 3, Common Ransomware. Please subscribe to Waterfall's Industrial Security Institute at youtube.com forward slash waterfall security solutions. Ed mentioned it, and it's something that we've talked about in plenty of episodes past, um, that IT and OT are generally um, overlapping more, that IT is sort of seeping into uh, OT functions. Um, I, I, I can't remember if we've ever really dove deep into why that's the case, why it is that IT folks would be taking on um, OT responsibilities. That's a good question. There's actually two aspects to IT-OT integration. When people use the term, they generally mean one or the other or sometimes both, and they don't distinguish. One aspect is what Ed mentioned, which is the IT-OT interface, which is an artifact in a network design saying I've got two different kinds of networks with two different classes of, of consequence of compromise, um, you know, two different functions, if you will. How do I connect these networks in a way that's safe? That's the, uh, it's a technology design concept. People talk about ITOT integration. They're talking about connecting the networks. But when people talk about ITOT integration, they're also talking about the other concept Ed was mentioning, which is <clears throat> getting these, these teams to work with each other and, uh, you know, putting sort of standards in place enterprise wide for security, for, uh, you know, certain kinds of, of designs. And this is a people thing. And, you know, in 2005, when, when the Gartner Group coined the phrase uh, ITOT integration, they were talking primarily about the people. They were talking about the organization. They were saying, look, there's gaps in these organizations. We got to bring these teams together. You know, one way to do it is to tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, talk to each other. Sort of the, the, the bigger stick way to do it is to say, you know, it's silly to have um, people who are experts on, you know, Microsoft SQL Server over here and people who are experts on Microsoft SQL Server over there. We need to consolidate these teams so that A, 
we can exploit their knowledge consistently across the entire enterprise, and so that B, um, you know, we're not we're not duplicating uh, all of these all these functions with the, the the cost that comes with it. So the, there's a cost saving that comes when you integrate these teams, and there's there's. Uh, you know, there's operational benefits that come because now the experts are talking to each other. They learn from each other. They can use each other's expertise. And there's, uh, you know, the, the the benefit of, you know, everything starts happening more consistently. You know, best practice is applied more consistently. So that's sort of the other aspect of ITOT integration. You know, one of the, the reasons that one of the drivers for IT getting involved in OT is the technology is coming together. And the 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 teams are coming together the prediction in 05 the really um controversial prediction in 05 was that within and i forget the numbers but it was something like within 10 years 80 percent of it and ot teams will report to the same c-level executive so they were talking about teams integrating and you know in hindsight they were right we're seeing both the networks and the teams integrating I'm thinking back when you were talking about about OT consequences, and uh, you know your your point. You know, I, I take your point that there's there's physical consequences of of you know compromising uh, OT or industrial systems, and uh, you know there may this may be outside the sort of the, the the scope of experience of enterprise security teams who are tend to be be focused on business consequences. Um, but these teams, you know, some of the business consequences they're focused on, you know, if, I mean, if you leak, I don't know, if, if someone steals contract information on a, a billion dollar contract, and this is make or break for the company, you know, it's, it, the company gets the contract, it, you know, survives the next five years, it loses the contract, it's out, we're, it's over, it's all done. Um, you know, this is an existential threat to the company. This seems like a fairly serious threat if somebody steals the contract information and comes in $3 lower and you lose the bid because, you know, someone stole the information. Um, in terms of, of, you know, severity and nature of consequences, can you talk about, you know, what is what is the real difference here? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, you know, it, it stands to reason, and I, I think it would be very difficult for someone to argue that in general, an OT security team is going to be dealing with uh, enormously consequential um, uh, threats and, and, and that they may be in a different category than what a normal IT security team would be used to. I, I don't think that's a terribly controversial point, that if you're dealing with life and safety critical things, that everybody would just sort of agree that that, that could be beyond the types of things that we're, we're used to. Now, that said, um, we have to be very careful with that message because it's easy for a IT security team to say, well, I understand that, you know, a, a vehicle barreling down the road at 80 miles an hour with a bunch of kids in it has to be safe. I understand that that, that tangible risk is, is substantial. I don't want anybody dying. But they could point to some pretty severe problems that could occur in a typical IT context. So I think the first thing we do is that we celebrate that everyone has their risks, both IT and OT, and everybody's doing the best they can to reduce it through good security architecture, good security practice, selection of great vendors, and, and so on. So we all agree on that. But I do think that the point uh, is reasonable that once you start looking at the, the sort of canonical or typical OT environment, where it's industrial control and they're um, you know, physical, tangible uh, equipment that might be controlling some, um, you know, some process that could kill people uh, or, or certainly harm or damage, uh, have some physical, tang tangible damage, that that is a, a set of, uh, that represents a set of consequences that has to be taken uh, very seriously and that uh, IT teams have to take note of this and, and be willing to acknowledge, not that their work is not important in IT security, it's incredibly important, it powers our world, but that when they do take on responsibility for things that have this safety and life critical uh, implication, it's a little different than what they're used to. And it may require a little special attention, a little change to certain processes, a, a willingness to be flexible in how you work with and listen to and cooperate with the engineering and operations staff 
who in many cases may know better and may understand you know, what's acceptable and what's not. It, it begs a cooperation between OT and IT that I hope happens, but you're, you're, you're correct to point to that as a question um, worth, worth uh, thinking through because anybody listening to our podcast here who maybe is an IT background, again, taking on OT responsibility, they, they, they should spend a, an ample amount of time trying to learn, you know, the worst case scenarios, the use cases that could kill people, um, you know, th- those kinds of things will allow them to, to have their team sort of stand up and take notice that the, the, these could be risks that go beyond the normal. So Nate, that, you know, that reminds me of, of, uh, another point here. Um, you know, I, I, I take Ed's point that, that, you know, the, the enterprise security experts, you know, need to learn about operations as they become responsible for it. They need to, uh, you know, work with the operations. The engineers need to work with these people. Um, but I suggest that it's it's a little bit more than just learning to work with each other. Um, you know, Ed brings up the uh, the safety consequence a couple of times. For certain kinds of physical consequences, uh, there's often regulation in place. Uh, you know, the government will have said. The engineering profession, this professional organization is responsible for certifying engineers and uh, policing the engineering profession, um, you know, policing minimum uh, educational and other qualifications requirements, uh, policing continuing education requirements, because these engineers are required to apply engineering best practice consistently to uh to physical to the design of, of physical systems and even automation systems that have unacceptable physical consequences. I mean, if uh, you know, if a bridge collapses, you always look at what was the cause of the collapse. Was the bridge you know maintained incorrectly? No, it was maintained exactly the way the engineers said it should have been maintained. Well, who designed this bridge? What was a design? Was it a, a design problem in the bridge? Yes, it was a design problem. Now the engineers job is on the line you know if the engineer who designed the bridge who signed off on the bridge failed to apply robust engineering best practice they can be thrown out of the profession they can you know lose their right to practice engineering if instead they applied all of the best practices that were known and it turns out that this is a new failure mode that the profession has never seen before you know this was the tacoma narrows bridge well, the engineer is not drummed out of the profession. The engineer applied engineering best practice. What has to happen is that best practice has to evolve. So when you get into some of these systems that have unacceptable physical consequences, it's not just that you have to you know, work together people. It's that the engineers are by law responsible for certain classes of decisions with unacceptable physical consequences. They need input, obviously, to evolve the, the profession, to evolve best practice, but they're the ones responsible for, for, uh, for applying the best practice. So it's not just that, you know, it'd be nice if you people work together. It's that you really have to work together for some of these classes of consequences. And, you know, it's not a, a black and white line. It, it's a gray area. And sort of the, the further you drift from the physical process, uh, sort of the, the heavier the influence of the, the enterprise security team. So it's, it's something that's you know, it's it's important to cooperate. It's important to to have respect for each other's uh, areas of expertise. It's also important to have you know respect for each other's legal areas of responsibility. Well, this has been great, Ed. Uh, you know, thanks for joining us. Before you before you leave us, is there a, a thought you'd like to to summarize? A thought you'd like to leave with our listeners? Well, I guess in in a sense, Andrew, we're you, you and I are talking to both um, traditional IT security folks, um, a lot of people that I've grown up with, and also the OT uh, community, which is in many cases is coming to acknowledge the cyber risks that exist in their environments. We're talking to both groups, and I guess the closing thought would be, gosh, I hope you all work together. That's <laughs> a good opportunity to empower each other, to learn from each other, to grow career-wise, what a great opportunity to, to be exposed to new types of technologies, new vendors, um, and also to take things that maybe in each context 
could be translated into the other environment very effectively. I think, Andrew, you and I have chatted about, um, you know, in the context of, say, unidirectional gateways, which you're one of the world's experts in. Um, I loved your book on that topic. Um, unidirectional gateways, probably not the top three or four things that an IT security staff would bring up as, you know, their, their, their key platform, but maybe it should be. You know, there's a lot of scenarios where set aside OT – where an IT security team could absolutely benefit from um, to, from from that type of functionality, and the reverse is true as well. Like IT security teams tend to be very good at the softer things, at security awareness and training, and helping people make good decisions. I, I would say that OT process engineers haven't had to deal with that. When was the last time a industrial engineer had to? you know, message a large community about making good decisions, you know, uh, in everyday usage, you know, maybe seatbelts and cars would be an example, but, but they maybe they can learn some of these softer skills from the IT security team. So I, I would say, Andrew, my parting message would be that the two groups should try to uh, work together, co- cooperate, and perhaps um, create a, an environment of, of empowerment on both sides. And maybe that seam that we talked about earlier, uh, perhaps we could start to see that seam uh, melt away. So that would be my hope. Andrew, for your last word. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, I, I, uh, I want to echo Ed's point that cooperation is vital. Um, and, you know, I like the point that, that he made it. It was a little bit subtle. I don't know if people caught it. He said, you know, don't view this as, as a chore. View it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to learn something interesting. Um, you know, I was reading recently. Now, I forget where I was reading it, but I, I was reading this article. There was I think, a whole book published on the topic. The most important word in the English language is the word get. It's not that I have to cook supper tonight. I get to cook supper tonight. I have, you know, I, I have a kitchen. A lot of people in the world don't. I have food. Not everyone does. You know, I have the, 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 the you know, the, the tools and the spices. And, you know, I have a lot. I get to cook supper tonight. So, you know, take the, the analogy over to the, the, uh, the ITOT integration thing. It's not that I have to go work with those engineers. It's that I get to go work with those engineers. Here's an opportunity. You know, every... You, you, it, it all depends how you look at the world. And, and uh, you know, I really like that point that, that uh, this is an opportunity. I get to go work with these people and learn something and, you know, make some new connections and, and, and so on. Okay. Well, on that cheery note, thanks to Ed Amoroso for speaking with you, Andrew. And thank you, Andrew, for speaking with me. Always a pleasure, Nate. We'll catch you next time. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everybody listening. Thanks to everybody listening.